I want to talk about the challenges that come with emerging technology, but also how we can address them from the perspective of a global technology company such as Enchain. So why does it matter? The economist Deirdre McCloskey has argued that the single biggest driver for our modern prosperity today, the reason why we went from an average income until around 1800 uh, of around $3 a day to $30 a day on average, an increase by a factor of 10, it all comes down to one thing, ideas. Innovation is the biggest ingredient to our modern prosperity today. Now, the economists have looked at that, and they've found that the average output of a worker in the UK in 2010 increased from 98,000 98, to 108,000. 5,000 by 2019, and you see that across other regions. But funny enough, there's still many companies that don't adopt it, and there's several reasons behind it. Um, some of them might surprise you. I think growing regulation is an obvious one, the nature of new tech becoming ever more pervasive. But sluggish competition is a surprising factor. What can we do to increase competition? How can we position companies better for the future? And I think that there are two factors, really, uh, to innovation. So one thing is innovative power itself, which is measured by patents usually. Um, I'm proud to work for a company that has a large patent portfolio of more than 3,000 patent applications. But it's not the only thing. France, for example, is not as innovative as Japan in number of patents, but very good at spreading innovation. And so they have a very strong economy. And so it's always important to keep that in mind. And so you don't need to be a big inventor or a large holder of patents to be able to drive innovation. You can be good at spreading it. And that creates that two-tier economy uh, between companies that drive innovation and others that don't. And companies that do drive innovation are significantly better off. And on, on this note, I just want to give a shout out to the organizers, Trescon, for organizing dates because it's down to conferences like this that really make a difference where ecosystem participants and representatives of government come together to drive future innovation. So what are the big things? Um, I think AI is an obvious one. Uh, then obviously blockchain technology that I'm going to talk about uh, later on a bit more in terms of how we can address some of the challenges. Um, some of the other trends we see uh, our digital payment supply chain management, and some of that goes hand in hand when it comes to traceability, traceability of funds. And then another one that I foresee is super apps, and we'll talk about a bit more about that. But they have a, a few things in common, a few themes, and it comes down to data governance, identity management, who controls and owns my data. Uh, it comes down to data integrity, how reliable or accurate is the data that I'm using? Can I actually rely on it. It comes down to data provenance, lots of privacy issues. Um, where does my data come from? Uh, what is the source? Uh, then there are questions around the user interface. You will have seen the latest AI gadgets uh, that you can clip onto your jacket and you can interact with it. So there's companies are thinking about how, how will this change the way we interact with technology? Is the smartphone going to be the future key tool or are we going to see other devices? And then it comes down to a very interesting one, uh, which boils down to content creation and monetization. Um, there have been some limits with the current internet structure today, and there are ways of increasing the efficiency of that using blockchain technology through micropayments, something we're very excited about. In other words, how can we bring transparency, accountability, and integrity to emerging technologies? How do we safeguard privacy? How do we control ownership? And how do we safeguard the lawful adoption of emerging technology? So let's start with, with the big one. And there's a reason why I combine AI with cloud computing, because it's highly reliant on cloud computing. And a, a big reason why some of the big tech companies are such key drivers of the biggest AI applications today. But let's start off with a few, um, maybe, 
little surprising uh, graphs, but still kind of shocking that around the third across different ages think that AI would actually mostly do harm, which is quite shocking and will certainly slow down adoption when people are skeptical. And they should be, they should be, right? Because it does come with certain challenges, but those challenges also come with opportunities. And that's what we're gonna talk about. And not surprisingly, the number of incidences has gone up over the years, also in line with the increase of the adoption of the technology. And there's been very little regulation. You have the executive orders from Biden that are looking to address it. The EU is having uh, its AI Act, which should serve as a modern standard in the West, just, as, uh, just like GDPR uh, did for privacy regulations. Um, but it's not alone. It's not, it's not the only thing that will help. Regulation alone won't do it. We need to rely on innovation, drive innovation, encourage companies to innovate, to safeguard the lawful adoption and the safe use of it. These are some of the main applications that we see today. One that is not here, which is equally significant because it, uh, because it does drive enterprise use, so it won't be measured in this uh, graph, which is uh, measured by unique website visitors, is uh, Anthropic. So we have OpenAI, which Microsoft has a stake in with 49%, but then you have Anthropic, which Amazon and Google have already invested in. And then uh, you have other players in AI when it comes to not just generative AI, but predictive AI, where Meta is a key player. And then you have Google Cloud collaborating with Spotify to predict user behavior and feed them the kind of music they want to listen to. And so they're all, they're all big tech companies that are driving this game. So the question becomes, what can we do other than just be at the mercy of those big companies and collaborate with them, which we can do, but are there other ways to compete? And one way of looking at it is to look at the challenges that will come with AI and to position yourself for those challenges. Here are some of the, the big ones that we see when we read across the landscape of different industries. So I wanna just pick out a few ones. Uh, computing cost is an interesting one. Uh, so AI, when it came out, people weren't really considering the cost of it, but it's incredibly expensive. And again, the reason why big tech companies are driving this, because they have the large data centers to scale and bring down the average cost. At the same time, they're getting into the energy business. So this is another interesting convergence between emerging tech, cloud and energy, but that's maybe a discussion for another day. Data monetization. So who gets rewarded for this? Is it just the AI application provider? Shouldn't it also be the author? But then what measures do we have in place to ensure that the author does get rewarded? And do we have payment mechanisms in place that are efficient enough to pay someone a penny every time someone issues uh, a query? Use of privacy. What happens to my data that I feed to the AI application every time I search for something, they know something about me. When I let an, an application study my company data and history, what happens to that data? Um, are my employees' privacy, privacy is at stake? There's very little transparency, very little verification. And so this is something we'll have to look at. One fascinating thing is that people don't think about how it's working, so they just see the benefit of it, and that's what, what's driving AI applications, but then there's a lot that comes with it that we don't think about and that we should address. Maybe one more I wanna highlight is fraud detection. Uh, again, predictive AI, a uh, very exciting area to be in. So to combine that with an efficient payment mechanism, a transparent record system such as blockchain technology, I think will be very exciting. So here, here are the big ones in summary, right? So it comes down to cost. Um, how can we make sure this is actually cost efficient and sustainable? Um, how do we make sure we ensure ownership rights? I keep my own data um, and I own it. Uh, there's lack of integrity controls. I don't know what, is, what, what, is, what I'm being fed is actually accurate. There's limited monetization. Content creators constantly complaining about how they can uh, be rewarded, financially rewarded for the input that they're providing. 
and then we have a lack of privacy. And so we see this and we think about, okay, this, this, sounds, this is all very challenging and, and something that uh, will be very difficult to address. But then what we see is that we actually had similar issues in other industries. And I liked what um, we heard yesterday um, from the Economic Advisory Council to the Prime Minister is that we may not be able to predict the exact outcome um, of AI applications, but we can still assess the risk and bring in accountability measures to make sure that the people that do certain things can be held accountable. And we see similar trends in other industries, including, including the payments industry. And so um, one of the things you will have heard about is the explainability aspect, which is nothing else than the traceability of applications, including AI applications, which is a big topic uh, in finance. How do we make sure we can trace funds when it comes to money laundering, terrorist financing? Um, how can we recover digital assets? There's lots of talk about de-dollarization now with central bank digital currencies upcoming. That's a big one. Um, and yet we see relatively little adoption, for example, of the digital rupee but it's very good to see that this is actually happening as opposed to uh, other regions. And so one thing that we, for example, do at, at Enchen, we help develop tools to more easily recover digital assets. And so there's this uh, big myth in blockchain technology when it comes to owning your keys and owning your own funds. Um, and the myth is that people say uh, you need to own your own keys. And it's, in other words, if I steal your keys, it's mine. And that's simply not the case. And it's never been the case in finance. And that's why it's important to educate um, and work not just with exchanges, but with miners directly to be able to more easily recover funds. And there are tools to do that where you don't necessarily need to involve exchanges. There are more, easier ways of doing that. And that's a big topic when it comes to the financing um, of Hamas, for example, um, and regulators need enforcement tools to be able to address uh, and meet AML requirements uh, and anti-terrorist financing. The last one that I want to talk about is super apps. So Musk, I think, is going to be very excited about what he's going to do with X. Um, it's going to... Uh, turn it into not just a financial app, I think, but going to try and create uh, an app experience where you can buy all sorts of things, have all sorts of experiences. When we think about what uh, Zuckerberg will do with WhatsApp, we might be facing a very similar experience. But all those things come with certain challenges. How do we make it still usable? Um, how do we make sure it scales, not just um, technologically, but how do we get user adoption? And more importantly, how do we deal with user privacy? If I'm storing all my data within one app and I can go basically from device to device and everything is stored in the cloud, how do we address privacy? Um, and so one big thing we see here is the notion of a sovereign cloud. Europe is very big on that. They want to make sure that data is kept within their own borders. And um, another one uh, we see is, uh, so it's, it's one thing is, is the metaverse. Uh, so even though we've seen very little adoption of certain uh, efforts such as uh, metas, um, companies are constantly working on gaming experiences. So they will look to combining those things within one experience. And the more of a usable um, experience you provide, the more of a go-to app you have, the more data you're going to feed to them, and the bigger the challenge will be. OK, so what, what can we do about it? So here are my three key takeaways on how to address them. And I'm, I'm going to talk about how blockchain technology specifically, I think, is best positioned to do that. So one is data integrity. Um, how can we ensure? data is in fact reliable, is actually what it purposes to be. It is accurate. 
um, control of ownership. How do I make sure that the, the, I can maintain ownership of the data? And then a combination of that is data hygiene. But hygiene goes a bit deeper. And this is where the monetization aspect uh, comes in. Data hygiene basically allows you to identify valuable content. And this is where you also avoid this overflow of data and this extreme cost. But if you have an efficient data structure, an in incentive mechanism that is efficient, you automatically reward users for content that is more valuable, that is more used, because not every piece of art is the same. So at Enchain, we just happen to use blockchain technology to address those challenges because it works best. It's immutable. In other words, uh, the security lies in the publicity of the network. That's why we work with an open public blockchain, the BSV blockchain, which is the most scalable and efficient solution out there. And there's more that you can learn about uh, that at our booth, G6, at the entrance. Um, in other words, immutability means if you do something wrong, there's a track record of it. If you cheat, there's a track record of it. No way to get rid of that. So if hackers try to do that, they can't cover their tracks. Um, decentralization is a big one. But decentralization to us mean, simply means a robust and stable system that others can build upon. It doesn't mean everyone needs to run their own node. It means you can rely on the stability of the system, something that's so integral in finance. Transparency. We need that to have an accountability structure. Things will go wrong in the world. It's the nature of it. But if we do have cer a certain level of transparency, there is a way to address that through accountability measures. And people will stop doing things if they know they're going to be caught. That doesn't mean giving up all your data and giving up your privacy. Because the honest user can still maintain his privacy on, the, on an open blockchain. But if something does go wrong, there need to be accountability measures in place. And integrity, we talked about this. But integrity on the blockchain means everything is timestamped. You know exactly when something was published. You know who published it first. So this, all of this is an incredible way of creating more efficiency. And this is where we can get the transaction cost down to below uh, the fraction of a penny, which is incredibly exciting when you think about all the emerging immersive tech experiences, when all of a sudden we have ways of financially rewarding people through incredibly f efficient means. And so to me, those are the biggest, most exciting things when it comes to blockchain technology. One is reducing fraud, whether it's corporate fraud or money laundering, or to do with terrorist financing, which will already create an enormous amount of efficiency. And the other thing is financial inclusion, giving more and better access to people around the world to take part in the economy, to participate in global trade. And that's why I'm so excited about India, because the sheer scale and the enthusiasm you have here is, uh, is breathtaking. And that's a testament to um, the conference here and everything I've experienced so far. And so, thank you very much.